Hey everybody, it's Gauntlet X, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena, and today we're going to be playing another premiere draft of Wilds of Eldraine. Without further ado, let's slam dunk our pack one pick, one rare, the Goose Mother. I don't think I've ever actually gotten to play this card before. I've definitely opened it in like pack three, pack two, when I was on more aggressive strategies, and I think I opened it once in the early access event with an opportunity to splash it, but I decided to do some other stuff there so this should be pretty fun i've played against the card a lot and it is quite powerful it is a two mana two two flyer at worst but if you dump a bunch of mana into it for that x mana ability you're making it a massive creature that spits out a bunch of food tokens gets to sacrifice those food tokens to draw cards when it attacks just a really really great card so we are going to start off with the goose mother here and for pack one pick two, we've got a pretty excellent follow-up. The Restless Vine Stock is going to help fix our mana for the Goose Mother. It's going to get our green and blue mana for our green and blue rare, as well as just be a really powerful man land to activate, turning into a 5-5 that turns something into a 3-3 three, three, when it attacks. So definitely a big fan of the Restless Vine Stock here. Could also take the Root Rider Fawn. That would work excellently with the Goose Mother, helping ramp up into just dumping a bunch of mana into it, as well as fixing our mana. The reason that I'm mentioning fixing our mana here is that we don't want to be 100% tied to green-blue from the start, even with a really powerful rare like this, because it is a really late game play where you're dumping a ton of mana into it, so we don't need to have access to green and blue mana till like turn 6, turn 7 ideally, in which case we can splash this in. We could be green and any other color and then splash in a little bit of blue, or we could be blue and any other color and then splash in a little bit of green, so we do want to think about taking mana fixing pretty highly so that we aren't forcing our ourselves to be dedicated green blue and here's a big reason why we see a pack with no good green card and just a pretty filler blue card so we would rather just take the best card in the pack regardless of color and try to pair that with green or blue as the core color of our deck with a little bit of a splash to get a goose mother in so pack one pick three we've got a witch's vanity which is pretty efficient at killing smaller creatures we've got a cut in and a rat catcher training which are great for aggressive decks Glass Casket, also decent at killing small creatures, but the Witch's Vanity does the same thing, plus quite a bit more, so I would prefer that if I go down that route. I think I'm going to go for Witch's Vanity over the Cut-In and Ratcatcher Trainee, even though these are pretty great cards. They are great for aggressive strategies, and the more splashing we do, and if we're playing green in general, if we're playing blue in general, we're going to have a better time with a slower, mid-rangey kind of grindy deck, which the Witch's Vanity fits into excellently, so it could be like green, blue, splash, uh, well, not green, blue, splash, black, ideally. Like green, black, splash, blue, or blue, black, splash, green, something like that. For pack one, pick four, we do have an Up the Beanstalk, which is a very fun build around. Draws you a card right when you play it, no matter what. And then if you are playing a good ramp deck that has a lot of high mana value cards, you could draw additional cards off of this later. X mana spells, they did change the rules on it. They will count. If I dump like three mana into X, that would be five mana value on the stack. So it would count for up the beanstalk if I'm casting the goose mother later. So that's pretty fun too. I'll go for the up the beanstalk here. I think the shrouded shepherd's also fine. There's a lot of aggro decks in the format with a lot of one toughness creatures. So just being able to cleave those all away can play well sometimes. Problem is that then we'd be playing around with green, blue, black, and white cards, which is probably a little bold this early into the draft. Pack one, pick five. We could take charade here we aren't 100% uh, tied to black here could do some bant combination green blue and white here with charade is a really nice card but there's also hollow scavenger which i'm a very big fan of just in green just in a color that is more likely to be a core color of our deck um, again a little weaker than charade but i am very much a fan of the card being able to attack and block as a 5-4 when necessary thanks to uh, being able to sack a food token it's also Evolving Wilds if we just want to help fix our mana some more, which would also be quite a reasonable pick. I think it's Sheree, Scavenger, or Evolving Wilds. I think all of those are very reasonable options. I'm going to just take the Scavenger here. I think I'm pretty likely to want to be green at the core here because green can help us get even more fixing to get a third color into the deck. So green at the core, and then our secondary, our tertiary color we can decide later. This is a very easy Hamlet Glutton pick six. This card is phenomenal for your green decks, really helping stabilize against aggro with this five mana six six body 
absolute roadblock so the aggro decks can't get through it. You gain some life off of it to make sure you stem the bleeding, and then you can just start attacking with a 6-6 six, six trample when you want to turn the game around. Excellent card. And here's another Hollow Scavenger. Pretty dang sweet. Also a Ferocious Werefox, but I think I would prefer to take more. Potential food synergy cards. Um, and this is also just cheaper on the curve. A little bit easier to get an expendable piece of bargain fodder on the board. Because it's very easy to find an extra like one mana at some point in the game. Extra two mana plus you have to have a creature on board to get the roll off of the werefox though. So that's a little more difficult to get that bargain fodder. Just take the hollow scavenger here. And we'll just take a pick eight Hamlet Glutton number two I guess. Yeah, again, Crystal Grotto Evolving Wilds are definitely the second and third best cards here to do some splashing for the Goose Mother, but with how open green is looking, getting a pick eight Hamlet Glutton, we can probably just force green blue, just be really heavy into green and take whatever few good blue cards we see. We haven't seen a lot here. Blue does not seem super open, but I think green is more than open enough to make up for it. And for pick nine, we do still see a charade here for uh, green, blue, white, doing a little splashing, a little fixing there. Could take titan Titanic Growth here, sticking towards mono green, or we could take Gatekeeper, which is great in these blue-green ramp kind of decks, because we can bounce an early game creature to slow our opponent down, and then we have just a random 6-5 to trigger our up the beanstalk. Sheree, Gatekeeper, definitely the best ones. I'm actually going to go for Gatekeeper here. Let's try to be just uh, a pretty simple, dedicated blue-green sort of ramp deck. Pretty late Collector's Vault, which does help with splashy nonsense, going for uh, three, four, five color stuff, which is possible in the format. If you want to learn more about uh, very solid ways to play these really, really multicolor decks, I would definitely check out Limited Resources or Lords of Limited. They have both talked in depth about potential four and five color strategies in this format when you are not one of the aggro decks. And now we have not a whole lot, but that's to be expected when there's only a couple cards left. That's gonna be a pick 15 flick of coin for somebody. They get to be uh, very happy about that one. And let's see what we get for pack two. We get an Agatha's Champion. Pretty excellent card to open up here. Five mana for a 4-4 four, four with Trample, and if we bargain away a food token or a treasure token or something when we play it, then it's also a removal spell on a stick. It's gonna fight any creature on the board and, uh, Basically kill anything that has three or less power uh, so it can win that fight. Yeah, we'll happily take Agatha's Champion. This is an excellent pack for the red player again. Torch the Tower, Emberth Veteran, Twisted Fealty, Kellen. But Agatha's Champion still a very good card for us to open up, so definitely not a miss. Pack two, pick two. We can go ahead and take a Bitter Chill now for some decent removal in uh, what is likely to be one of our main colors. No big reasons to take any other card in this pack, honestly. It's a relatively weak pack in general. Top three cards are probably like Bitter Chill, Rat Out. Third best card, probably the Spear Guard, but that's just good in aggro. Nothing at all close to what we're doing. So for us, our top three is like Bitter Chill, Rat Out, and maybe, I don't know, a Troublemaker Roof or something. We're just going to be scooping up that Bitter Chill. Alright, so we got some three drops on curve. Turn two is definitely going to be spent just playing an up to Beanstalk or Collector's Vault or something, not putting a creature down. So we want to find some good cheap creatures. Root Rider Fawn is probably the number one card we could possibly find. Currently, we look very, very able to just play green and blue, so we don't really need Scarecrow Guide, but it would be a two drop creature, which is nice. Could take a Werefox that fits into the 4-mana slot on the curve, gives us another potential piece of bargain fodder with that roll token. Or we could get a little splashy here and go for the Threadbind. 4-mana 3-3 three, three flyer, not a good deal, but if we have the uh, the splash mana for the Adventure, then it is a very, very good deal, a removal spell and a creature. I think we take the potential highest upside card here, and even if it gets cut in the end, I think we have enough cards that uh, won't be that big of a deal if we missed on a pick there. Although now there's a Lord Skitter, and that Lord Skitter is pick four, and this is one of the stronger rares in the format. Three mana for a 3-3, three, three, and you get a rat every turn during combat too, so the turn you play it, it's three mana for a 3-3 three, three and a 1-1 one, one rat. Those are excellent bargain fodder. 
they're excellent at getting aggressive. Obviously, it's stronger in like black, red aggro and stuff, but still the amount of just rectangles you can put on the board, the amount of tokens you can put on the board, it's pretty absurd with it. That is gonna make me want to lean towards a black splash over a white splash. We could take Sheree there with the Threadbind Clique, really uh, leaning on the white splash, but Lord Skitter gets me back towards that potential uh, black splash instead. Uh, now we have Curse of the Werefox, just a removal spell in our main color. Not a great one, but a fine one. Nothing else really going on in this pack. Could just try to be Parallel Lives combo, but that's, that's a bit of a win more kind of card. Just doubling up food tokens and whatever. It's not uh, not that crazy. Uh, pick 6 Utopia Sprawl. Really love to see that. We definitely like Ramp in this deck that has several 5, 6 mana cards. We also love some fixing to potentially get that Black Lord Skitter Splash in. So let's happily take a Utopia Sprawl. For pick 7, we can go ahead and take a Crystal Grotto. We could also take an Archive Dragon for another top end card. Or could try to splash in the uh, the Questing Druids card draw adventure of Seek the Beast. Genealogist would be fine too. I think it's really Archive Dragon or Crystal Grotto being the most exciting. I'm going to take the Crystal Grotto here. Let's get that, uh, that fixing locked in. There's so many charades in this draft pod, it's kind of hilarious. Um, but I think I'm just taking third Hamlet Glutton. Yeah, when mom lets us have three Hamlet Gluttons, we'll take three Hamlet Gluttons. Now we'll take a Territorial Witch Stalker, which is not the best card ever, but we are definitely a slower deck that is planning on winning by just having larger cards than our opponent. So in the early game, what we want to be doing is just prolonging the game and surviving their early attacks, and a stupid little dorky 2-3 defender can certainly do that. Now we'll take a Troublemaker Oof just to fill out the early plays. I'm not going to be splashing in a rat out off of just... Probably one or two swamps with a Crystal Grotto Utopia Sprawl. Uh, we get that Werefox nice and late. That's beautiful. Get a Genealogist in here. Fill out that three mana slot. Another Ice out, but we're probably not playing double blue spells in the end at this point. Kind of just like heavy green. Maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe something like five islands and a swamp something like that 10 forests i guess we got to make room for our non-basics so that counts gonna be a little different but overall uh could take twining twins double blue would be a little difficult as i was saying but this maybe just gets us to actually be full on green blue splashing a little bit of black four mana four four flying vigilance ward one is just kind of great stats probably do take that could splash in a Taken by Nightmares or Feed the Cauldron for removal. Could just play main deck removal with Graceful Takedown or main color removal with Graceful Takedown. I think the best cards are definitely the Twining Twins and the Graceful Takedown. I'm going to take the Twins. Get a 4 mana 4-4 four, four flyer in here. Get some more evasive threats. Pack 3, pick 2. Hamlet Glutton number 4 or Stormkeld Vanguard number 1. Kind of it. There's a Spreading Seas we could dork around with. But we've got triple gluttons. Let's get a little bit of main deckable artifact enchantment removal. Throw a vanguard in here. This up the beanstalk is going to be putting in work at this point. Um, basically nothing I really want to do with our pack three. Yeah, I don't really want any of these cards. Honestly, beanstalk worms probably the closest. But I have five better... Or sorry, I have four better five mana value cards and i have four five mana value cards and like three six mana value cards two four mana i've got too much top end to really put in the more filler bean stock where i'm over just how good these other five drops are i think i still take it though i'm not splashing in rat out or conceded which i'm certainly not excited to play a coral smith um let's get some more early game blockers I guess we could use Croaking Curse as like a 2-drop to slow down one of their early creatures, but the earlier you play it, the weaker it is, right? Putting a Curse Roll on a 2-2 two -two is significantly worse than putting a Curse Roll on a 4-4. Four -four. So this doesn't even really work as like a 2-drop blocker kind of thing. I'm just going to stick with the Witch Stalker here. We could try to splash in uh, another Witch's Vanity. 
But this is, I don't know, Witch's Vanity is a little of an awkward splash as well because it's so much better the earlier you play it. Because it only kills small cards anyway. So you kind of just want to kill their card immediately. Let's take another Witch Stalker. We might even be cutting this Witch's Vanity. Just play one Lord Skitter off of treasures and crystal grottos and stuff. Um, what do we have here? Another Beanstalk Worm, I guess, is about it. I guess the Iron Crag is playable ramp. Just two mana man rock to get these these uh, these big spells, sure. Not exciting ramp, but playable. Hatching plans. Do we get to be a hatching plans deck just because of Hamlet Gluttons? Probably not. That's three bargain cards total. Feels a little bit too low for the hatching plans, but could be three Hamlet Glutton double ice out. Always awkward to be trying to hold up counter spells in a green deck because you always want to be just tapping out for your biggest creature each turn, basically. But maybe we can justify it off of hatching plans. Um, Sir Armont is a good card, but I just don't, again, feel like I can get another 5 drop in here. So might as well just not do splashy nonsense to fit a 5th 5 drop into the deck. Wow, that's a pick 8. Welcome to Sweet Tooth. Good lord. This card by itself is essentially a 2 mana 3-3 three, three that comes with a food token. And if we get like a hollow scavenger alongside it, putting a food out before I play the Welcome to Sweet Tooth... It's like a 2-mana 4-4 four, four that comes with a food. The thing is just insane. Very happy to take a Welcome to Sweet Tooth there. And just going through the motions here, taking the strongest card out of these packs. Ooh, we do get one Transmuter. I think we can definitely play the card. Uh, even if I wanted more 2-drops over it earlier. Well, triple Ice Outs. With hatching plans, maybe? Again, we need to look at if we have any other instant speed things to do outside of counter spells. Because if not, it's going to be real difficult. I think the vast majority of our cards are sorcery speed. Which makes it really hard to just hold up double blue and one. So we're just always doing something with our mana. Yeah, I mean, it's just a pile of sorcery speed creatures and a pile of sorcery speed spells. The only instance in this entire pile are triple ice out. You could still go for the triple ice out, triple glutton, hatching plans, game plan, but I don't think I'm going to do that here. I think that uh, we should get more dedicated on just straight up jamming out the big stuff, curving up here, ramping up as well. Utopia Sprawl, Iron Crag for the ramp. Sad we didn't get any Root Rider Fawns in the end. That ended up being pretty awkward. So that's unfortunate. So... Do we even need the Lord Skitter Splash in the end? Worst case scenario, we threw a Lord Skitter into our collection. Honestly, I don't think we do... I think we have enough ways to end the game even without like a Lord Skitter kind of bomb. We've got a Goose Mother bomb and just plenty of just giant creatures in general. They don't have to be like bomb rares to win the game. Yeah, I mean, Lord Skitter is a great card, but Witch's Vanity is not great off the splash because we hit it so much later when the mana value 2 creatures matter a lot less. And... Yeah, so it would just be Splash basically just for Lord Skitter. Yeah, let's drop those out. And let's make a non-creature spell pile so I can see how my creatures are doing at curving out. Pretty solid, especially when you consider some of their adventures. Like the Gatekeeper has a two-mana bounce spell. The Scavenger is getting us food on turn one. Triple Genealogist is kind of a lot for how few uh, other cheap creatures we have, so we probably want to cut one or two of those. Still kind of like the Threadbind in here, if we keep Collector's Vaults and Crystal Grotto in. 
And there's a, a couple ways to randomly hit that uh, adventure and get really good value there. But that's also a potential cut because it's not going to be consistent. The twins, though, they don't need the adventure to be good. They're just a great flying vigilant threat in the first place. This is going to be a high curve deck, but I'm into it. Green is just my jam in this format. It's just it's wild. I just play green all the time. I just, I enjoy it. I played a lot of red aggro too. I've played basically the two best things. <laughs> if you don't want to be just straight up aggro, green is just the best thing to be doing really. But I do enjoy being straight up aggro often enough that I've played a good amount of aggro. It's kind of changed as the format progressed, right? Like that first week or two, I feel like I played almost exclusively red for a long time, right? Definitely the first week. I remember we played seven or eight drafts. We trophied like five times and every trophy run was just a red-based aggro deck. But then things kind of pivoted into me just opening, uh, <laughs> opening the busted rare in green like four times. Just kept playing that. Tons of green, black, stuff like that. I just love Hamlet Clutton. Hamlet Clutton is just my homie. Just my MVP. All right. Let's stop gushing about cards here and cut down to probably one genealogist at this point. Honestly, maybe we are just cutting the thread bind. Keep it simple here. Yeah, I'll still have a Bitter Chill, still have a Curse the Werefox, an Agatha's Champion, Stormkeld for Artifact Enchantments, Skatekeeper for a Bounce. Yeah, probably don't need to turtle around with that. Uh, and then we have nothing off color, right? We only have the Twins' Adventure, which is really not necessary. So I can drop Crystal Grotto for another just straight up forest. Really make sure that that Utopia Sprawl consistency is there. Because you need specifically a forest on a board. Crystal Grotto, Restless Vinestalk, and Islands do not count. Yeah, I like this. It's a 10 8 split. 17 green cards, 5 blue cards, but the big important card is that our best blue card is double blue. They're the big important thing to keep in mind there. Yeah. I like this. I like this a lot. Green blue ramp with the best rare, the big reason to try to be the archetype, the goose mother here. We are definitely going to call it a deck here. All right, here we have a look at our completed deck list for today. We're on a green blue ramp deck with a ton of excellent, excellent finishers. The namesake cards for the deck being the massive goose mother bomb rare this is going to be a gigantic flyer that comes with a bunch of food tokens and gets to eat those food tokens to draw some cards as they attack there's also the three hamlet gluttons the excellent top end cards for any green strategy in the format and this deck is going to be no different so there's our green eggs and ham up here we've also got storm Keld vanguard for main deck artifact and enchantment removal as well as a hard to block finisher and a gatekeeper that gives us some more early game bounce while giving us another big late game creature and an agatha's champion that gives us somewhat of a finisher and a removal spell all in one so really excellent top end to ramp into we don't have that much ramp in this deck just an iron crag and a utopia sprawl mainly but we also have collector's vault that can spit out some treasure tokens which can ramp into something kind of like one time because we have to sack the treasure to do it but that can also leave behind those tokens to bargain away it can be a decent card selection engine in the late game when we're flooding out so with the not like a ton of removal or not a ton of ramp in this deck, we do have a decent amount of early game blockers and ways to kind of prolong the game. We've got the double hollow scavenger getting us some food and just being a relatively large body for its mana cost. Some witch stalkers just blocking things, oof, and genealogist to trade off, and then uh, transmuter as well. Nice high toughness dork that can also put a cursed roll on our opponent's creatures to slow them down. So, decent amount of uh, early game creatures to block and dirtle around with while we wait to set up our massive finishers. Other than that, we've got a couple pieces of removal, a curse of the werefox and a bitter chill, and a very nice up the beanstalk card draw engine. But overall, 
very, very much like the classic green-blue ramp archetype. This is kind of just like a snapshot of what this color pair is really doing in this format, and I think the deck looks pretty great overall, so I'm very excited to see how it does as we head into the gameplay. Here we are for game one with a definite mulligan to start things off. This is significantly better mana-wise, but there's a lot of very high mana value cards in this hand, so pretty awkward openers for us. I think we've got to keep this one, though, and just ditch probably one of the four drops. Three four mana things to do is pretty redundant. Yeah, it would make sense to just instinctually get rid of the glutton, but I think... Um, once we get to four mana, I'm still going to have two things to do on turn four while we wait uh, for the fifth mana. Well, not turn four, but on four lands, we'll have two different things to do. Let's ditch the Werefox, I think. We are specifically hoping to draw another blue source by doing so. So it was between the Werefox and the Twining Twins for the card we want to ditch there. Because we definitely want to keep Transmuter, since it gives us another cheap thing to do if they play a decent-sized body early. Alright, we do get punished. The big reason to ditch the Twins instead of the 4-3 um, is no matter what lands we draw into, we know we'd be able to cast the 4-3, but with the Twins we have to specifically find another blue source at some point. Well, here comes a Bargain card, probably. They're casting Rat out, or they just want to get aggressive. Let's see. Bargain card post-combat. It is Rowan's Grim Search, so they are going to be digging very far through their deck. Look at the top four cards, put up to two back on top, the rest into the grave, and they draw two and lose two. So if they don't like any of the top four, they can just mill four and draw two, which is digging six cards deep for whatever they're looking for. Very nice card draw spell. Luckily, doesn't impact the board in any way, so we don't have to worry about any early aggression here. We gotta worry about some late game card advantage stuff. And it is a green black deck with a Hamlet Glutton and a Stormkeld Vanguard going to the grave, so we'll be interesting to see who has the biggest cards here. I feel like we have a decent hand for this kind of matchup. Because we've got our own big threats, and we also have that curse roll looking really good against big green dorks. There's a Witch's Vanity, but Hollow Scavenger is luckily a 3-drop, so that doesn't actually do anything. And this is probably a little greedy since they still haven't hit a green source, but I'm just going to hold on to this curse uh, for whenever they do get a card. Well, I can curse the Scream Puff, but it'll still be a Death Toucher. It'll just be a 1-1 one, one Death Toucher. Could attack him with Scavenger, then I just trade the Scavenger into it if they block. I think that's fine, and then we just drop Glutton afterwards. Because I don't really want to just hold up the mana to buff Scavenger right now when I have enough mana to play Glutton. Next turn, I could cast, like, a 5-drop and hold the Scavenger back, but I'd need another food token for that. I guess they're also putting a Wicked Roll in the Scream Puff. Yeah, Scream Puff for Glutton is not a bad trade. If they don't have removal for Glutton here, we'll just take the trade. They do have removal for Glutton, though. So they are tapped out of eating a food, so if I hit an island to activate Beanstalk, just hit them for 8. Not lethal yet, unfortunately. Would be lovely to find lethal when they're tapped out of eating food. Ooh, welcome to Sweet Tooth. So another food for the Scavenger, but if I play that, I'm not playing Agatha's Champion this turn. Are they low enough on life here to give up on the Cursed roll? Just play Welcome to Sweet Tooth and a 3-4? Maybe. Like, if we find the next blue source to be able to activate a Restless Vine Stock, then it could be worth it. That way I get to keep Agatha's Champion for if they play another creature. They've got these two food tokens to eat, though. It's the difficult part. Yeah, no, let's just actually curse the Scream Puff. 
could try to go just purely for the race here. Drop a 3-4, slam in for 3, and just hope they tap out of eating the food again. Just get that life total as low as we can, as quick as we can. But they are a green-black deck that's likely pretty good at gaining life and grinding things out here. Unfortunately, they do have the artifacts or enchantment removal for the cursed roll, which is very bad for us. It means the screen puff is just going wild. They've got six points of life gain on the board. There's the bitter chill. So if they don't have a second enchantment removal spell, we just get to chill the uh, screen puff and keep it down. Um, only thing I get to cast this turn is bitter chill if I do that, but I think I should. I could technically attack into the Troublemaker oof here. Because I can sack the food if they block, but then I won't have a food on board for Welcome to Sweet Tooth. So I'd essentially be trading two plus one plus one counters for their Troublemaker oof, which I don't think is actually worth it here. Because if we wait till we get the counters, then I have a 3 3 and a 5 4 potentially, which can attack into these two cards pretty well. Very nice card draw engine for our opponent now. Greta to go with the food. Start sacking them to draw cards. They are tapped out, so we can Agatha's Champion away the Greta very freely. Ooh, and we find a Goose Mother for later. Pretty dang happy with that. I guess we could have put the counters on the Scavenger and sacked our 1-1 token here instead. That might have been interesting. Still feel like this is probably better. Just keeps more creatures around. Spreads out our threats pretty well. Alright, there's their own Territorial Witch Stalker. And another Greta. Well... Stalker is getting the buff from that tapped down Scream Puff. Oh, Collector's Vault. Start drawing cards, discarding cards, and have the mana for the Twining Twins ready. It's exciting. I feel like I'm just playing a 6-6 six, six Flyer first, though. So Champion, they double block with these two, and I kill a single one. That's not great. Human Attack is fine, because they can only get the plus one, plus one counter at Sorcery Speed. So the human just trades one for one into one of these, which is cool with me. Scavenger? Is it greedy to hold on to the scavenger here? I don't think so, because we know that we're going to have plenty of food tokens to sacrifice to it next turn. They have another rat out here. Clear out the uh, human. Ooh, no, a ferocious werefox. Fair enough. Pretty good. They've got one card in hand here, hopefully. That card is not a removal spell. Because there is a 6-6 six, six flying goose mother. They do get to draw another card off Greta, if they just need to dig for removal to clear out the goose mother. All right, Horsemen for the Vanguards. They can blow up the Bitter Chill, I guess, while we're tapped out. That's fine. Doesn't deal with our Flyer in any way, so we still just kill them very quickly in the sky. Not quite two attacks because of their food token. 
but definitely in three hits we can kill them. And they can't really attack in while I have the Goose Mother untapped. And then I get to play even more blockers next turn. I think we're good here, especially if we top deck an island to guarantee a Twining Twins attacking alongside the Goose Mother next turn. Then we can kill them in two swings. Yeah, let's get that down. Drop a Collector's Vault. actually played that out incorrectly. Because of the treasure token, we could have drawn a card, discarded this forest, and still played the Twining Twins. We'd just be tapped out right now instead of holding one up. But I think that'd be fine, because the only thing this one mana is holding is the ability to buff Scavenger, which I don't think is necessary. I guess it's not horrible to do so, though. So scavengers, what, a 5-4 here? Just make sure they don't uh, get a food token. And we should be good. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I kind of want to not die to, like, titanic growth also. Means we do like this. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. We would still die to titanic growth if I block like this. But removal is a lot more likely than titanic growth. And if I block in a way where Twining Twins dies, then we die to removal. Because then they just removal spell the Goose Mother and we can't kill them next turn anymore. Is there any way to block where we don't die to Titanic Growth or removal? Yes, there is. I have to just let Agatha's Champion die. Then it's 4, 5, 6, 7, and if they Titanic Growth, it's 11 and not 12. So this way we play against, play around both Titanic Growth and Removal. Yep. Alright. And there is the concession. We will start things off 1 and 0, oh, heading into game 2. Here we are now for game two. Definitely a slower hand. Very happy to be on the play here. If our opponent is an aggressive strategy, they might just beat us down before we do anything but Collector's Vault. But if they're not, this Collector's Vault is going to make sure that we just draw straight gas and it's going to ramp us up into whatever we're drawing. Could be pretty nice. No play turn one from our opponent. Here is our turn two Collector's Vault. The very fantastical sound effect. Another black green deck. Troublemaker oof, with nothing to bargain to kill our Collector's Vault. Pretty happy to see that. A little greedy with the Hollow Scavenger, I want to get the food from it. That'll also lead into a turn 4 Hamlet Glutton. So I'm going to draw a card, discard a card, and get a food here, I think. So let's see what we hit first. Another land, just discard that. Do not need that many islands. And then let's get the food. Now next turn, I could just immediately sack a treasure, drop a Hamlet Glutton. Conceded Witch to make the Troublemaker Oof a 3-3. Oh, three, three. Well, very mana inefficient, so we are happy to see that. Just spend the turn putting plus one plus one on their card. And that is it. Great draw for us. The Twining Twins means that we can just spend the turn playing a 4-4 Flyer instead. Keep the treasure for some other stuff. Yeah, this is still a perfectly large threat. And then we get to keep more treasures, more bargain fodder. Play around with that stuff later. 
Could have used the Collector's Vault and then tapped two lands and sacked two treasures to play the Twins. But I don't think I want to expend all of my treasure resources that quickly. The really cool thing about... Well, there's a lot of interesting things about Collector's Vault, but one of the cool things about it is that... Um, if you don't spend the treasures like in the early game, it always gives you this two mana mana sink later. So you can get to the point where you like draw a six drop, tap out for the six drop, and then just use your treasures to use the vault. So there's like always going to be something to use excess treasure tokens on. Not really in a rush to play a slightly bigger card this turn by using a treasure. And now I can just Hamlet Glutton keeping the treasure, sacking the food instead. Or, could just, uh, since I have like enough mana here, could just use the scavenger. Use the food for the scavenger later. So glutton with the uh, treasure token. Could also put a monster roll on Twining Twins, and then I have one, two, three, four mana up. So we just put a monster roll on it and play a four, three. It's fine. I think I'd rather just drop the glutton, though. Yeah, let's just drop the glutton. And I am going to sack the treasure, I think. Keep the food for the scavenger. Back to 17 life. Shatter the Oath on the Glutton. Clear that out. Buff the Witch. We take three because of the Menace. Okay. Let's use the Collector's Vault. I guess I could attack with a 5-5 five, five Vine Stalk if I want. Instead, but no, probably. I mean, maybe we're even just using the Monster Roll and playing a 4-3 instead of using Vault here. If I use Vault here, 2 mana for that, then I have 5 mana up if you count the treasure. Not enough to use both halves of the Werefox. Alright. Just Werefox it up. I think that's fine. And they're tapped out, so I'm just going to do it all main phase 1. I'm lazy. I'll do that even when my opponent's not tapped out. It's not a good habit to get into. Should try to do... Uh, Try to do some stuff main phase 2 so that they don't know exactly what to play around during combat. If you leave a bunch of mana untapped during combat, they have to consider all kinds of combat tricks, instant speed removal, and stuff like that. But I, I just get lazy, and I just slam everything down. I just put my cards on the table. It's like playing poker with your hand revealed. <laughs> It's like, I mean, this hand's good. I think I win. Not generally the best idea. A Root Rider Fawn. Luckily, doesn't matter too much. Turn six here. But it could still fix their mana, which might matter. If I buff the Werefox, they can't uh, block and kill it with a single creature, but a double block still only kills one of their creatures anyway. It's just that I get to choose which I kill out of two targets instead of just running right into a Conceited Witch or a Troublemaker. I think I'd rather just put the Royal Roll on the Scavenger. I need six mana to do that. Four, five, six. Here's seven. Which means... Could get a treasure here and still have one, two, three, four, five, six... And if I draw something better than Genealogist, I just discard Genealogist. I should have uh, kept the land in hand doing this, and then I could still play the land post-combat, and then Genealogist plus Scavenger this turn. But we do definitely want to Vault pre-combat in case that changes things. Ooh, okay, well, we're discarding Genealogist to play a Vanguard, which works out fine, because then we would have still ended up discarding Genealogist, so I could just drop a 6-drop this turn. So... 
I have not played with uh, Collector's Vault that much, so... Not doing a great job with, like, the mana sequencing and stuff. When do you play the land versus uh, this card the card? How much mana do you need up? Stuff like that. Alright, there's just the concession from our opponent. We just got too much beef over here. And very large evasive threats. So we are now 2 and 0 oh, heading into game 3. Alright, here we are for game 3. All the massive things to ramp into. And 3 mana sources. I only need to top deck 1 land for the hand to be great. Let's go for it. Turn 1 Utopia Sprawl for a blue source on my forest. Because I have a cheaper double blue card. Which means I want double blue on turn 3 even. But I don't need double green till turn 4. No. I also have more... Um... Oh, it's rounded up? If I do this, I get a food and then I attack draw a card. I think I'm curving out. I think I'm curving out. Because it's rounded up, so we get the food even at 3 mana. Smallest Goose Mother of the day, probably. I doubt I'm playing a 2 mana 2-2 two, two Goose Mother. Completely lost my train of thought of what I was talking about there. Um, oh yeah, the other reason to Utopia Sprawl for blue is that uh, we have more force than Islands in the deck. We're more likely to just top deck the second green. But the biggest factor, of course, being I have Twins. Turn 3. Gluttons not till turn 4, and if I don't find a second green source, I can just champion turn 4 instead, and still wait a little bit for Glutton, so. Uh, opponent is just not cool. With turn 2, 3-3 three, three flying Goose Mother that attacks and draws a card immediately, it is uh, it is a pretty busted start. And they're just immediately going to leave the game, so we are 3-0, and heading into game number 4. Here we are for game four, looking to draw another island for the Twining Twins, but we've got some decent adventures and a 3-2 in the meantime. We've got removal. Perfectly reasonable hand. Get the vine stock out of the way. Now I can do entry denied turn two if I need to. Ooh, if they're just going to play an Ash, I'm probably going to play Bitter Chill. Because this is just going to get bigger and bigger as the game progresses, and it's already just immediately slamming in for damage. Yeah, I just got to make that thing chill out. Next turn, we can get a food and play a Troublemaker Oof in the same turn. Or I could bounce something and make a food. Ooh, they're stuck on two mana? Bounce feels real good when they're stuck on two. Just slow them down here. Spend their next turn replaying Armory Mice. Next turn we play a Twining Twins because we did hit the next blue source. Yep, there's the Armory Mice. Oh yeah, I'm loving how things are looking. Iron Crag not really going to do anything at this point. We've hit all the mana we need, pretty much. I guess it's our sixth land. This is mana number five, this is mana number six for Gatekeeper, so it actually does help uh, if we don't find another land. Just not, like, super impressive, like it would be turn two. All right, Gingerbrute gets in, can't block that thing. Down to 17, but now we start hitting for four a turn. We top deck Hamlet Glutton, too, with the food from Scavenger. We can just immediately play it. Yeah, this is pretty gross. Big, beefy creatures all day long. That is what life is all about, isn't it? That's how everybody starts the game, right? When you started Magic, what was your favorite color? I just immediately started with just land werewolves and crawl worms, classic stuff. Get 
just big green monsters. Because when you first start the game, it's really easy to just not really care about like the mana numbers and stuff. You just look at the stats on the creatures and you're like, these green creatures are so much better than everything else. <laughs> They're so huge. It's actually insane. That can't be fair. Set up for the gatekeeper next turn. Just play a 3-2 for now. Play a 3-4 with Transmuter. Yeah, I think either way is fine. Could also just tapped out, play a 3-2 and a 2-2 with the Troublemaker Roof. I think I want to get ready to get a 6-5 down. That should be pretty difficult for them to find profitable blocks for. Should be another 2-for-1 in our favor. Like our Hamlet Glutton got. All right, so Ball Guest is going to trade into the Scavenger, which is fine. We clear a path out here. I don't think I need to Curse Troll. I'm just going to play a 6-5. One of the big questions will be, am I ever going to activate Restless Fine Stock today? It has felt like I've just always had more stuff to dump on board, you know? More threats. The simplest time to activate Vine Stock is when you just run out of other things to do. But we should probably be taking that into account a little more often, because it does basically function as a haste creature. It's an additional 5 damage the turn we activate it, so we need to keep that in mind a little more often than we have been. Um, two mana to curse. Wouldn't have the mana up for vine stock afterward. I like cursing the merry bards, and they have nothing that can kill gatekeeper. They have to chump it. I can't kill them here because they can't put a counter on twins with anything. But force a chump block, put them to one seems pretty dang good. All right, there's the concession from our opponent. I guess they could have accomplished pretty much the same thing by activating the Vine Stock, because then they have to block two of my creatures. Right, because I've got a 5-5 and a 6-5 attacking on the ground. They have to block both of them to not die. But then they could go 3-2 and 2-2 on the 6-5 and just trump block the 5-5, go to 1. Yeah, so they would actually kill one of my creatures if I went for Vine Stock instead. Yeah, I think that... That play was fine. Actually, hold on. We could have forced an Ash Chump block because I could have uh, put a Curse Roll on the Bards and tapped it and then bargained that to exile Ginger Brute. Or bargain the Iron Crag to exile Ginger Brute, something like that. And then they only have one blocker left. They have to just straight Chump with Ash. All right. Either way, we just played some massive, massive stuff. Our opponent got stuck on a mana a little bit early in the game, so they didn't get to cast anything that big, but they were also red-white aggro, so... They're not going to have cards nearly as large as ours if we get into a position where we are relatively stable. Should be a pretty decent matchup for us, and it certainly was there. We are now 4-0, and oh, heading into game 5. Here we are now for game five, a little bit lower on mana than I would like to be, but we can try to dirt around with Collector's Vault to dig for lands. Also up the Beanstalk does draw us a card, which gets us closer to drawing our next land. I think I'm going to keep it here. The curve is not that high, right? Because I've got, well, by this deck standards, the curve is not that high. I've got two mana, I've got two two drops, I've got a three drop and a four drop and a five drop. Not horrible. We are on the draw here, which also helps find those lands. We get to dig one card deeper. All right, let's get our food token. Our opponent is on green with an edge wall in. Green, blue, mirror match it is. Turn to Elvish Archivist, which is very threatening. Do draw into an Iron Crag, which I think I play immediately. 
Elvish Archivist is super threatening. This is one of those cards you have to kill it as quickly as possible or it will run away with the game with just the amount of value that it can provide. It's a Storm Keld Vanguard to blow up our Iron Crag. Unlucky. I'm just dropping up the Beanstalk here. That does find land three. Beautiful. Not only does it find land three, but it's our one tap land in the deck, so we get that out of the way when we don't need the mana. So, kind of the, just the perfect land draw there, especially because we have a double green and a double blue card in hand. Alright, there's Tempest Heart turn four. Luckily, their Archivist has done literally nothing for them. Unluckily, we do not find land four. If we did, we would be in a real excellent spot now with Twining Twins out. Instead, I think we have to jam out Collector's Vault. Which means no blocks here, but it's not like Scavenger's going to block a Tempest Heart when we don't have the mana to eat the food up anyway. Yep, yeah, this ain't great. Let's drop the Vault and pass from there. That removal spell in the Iron Crag hit us real hard here. If it weren't for that, then yeah, this would be a twin's turn. All right, there's a Garuk's Uprising, which draws them a card because of Archivist. And then it'll draw them another card from Vanguard. Yep, and then there's an Artifact to go with the Archivist. Archivist is doing its thing. Okay, I do find the fourth mana, so I can play a Twining Twins. But Sports State's getting pretty bad for me. Still does feel like Twining Twins is the best card I can play here. Yeah. There's the sixth mana for the Stormkeld Vanguard, and here it is. Buffs the Tempest Heart as well. Uprising draws the card here. No blocks, we take the four, we're down to eleven. No land here, so no glutton yet, but I can curse the Werefox, kill the Tempest Heart or the Archivist. It kind of feels like I have to kill the Tempest Heart. We are at the point where we have to preserve our life total above anything else. And I can Collector's Vault and do that because I have the treasure token off Collector's Vault. So we can use Collector's Vault and then Curse the Werefox. And then if we don't get to the point where we're just jamming out a Hamlet Glutton, we're just going to be dying to Storm Killed Vanguard. But I can block everything else, making this a 5-5 Killing Tempest Heart. So I think we set up for that to be the play. Draw a card, discard a card. We do find the next land, which is very helpful. I think Troublemaker looks pretty decent here. Scavenger for more food is fine. Let's actually get rid of the Ferocious Werefox, I think, because I'm already putting a roll, a monster roll onto the Twining Twins. I guess a Glutton with a monster roll on it is a 7-7, so we should consider that. Maybe we actually get rid of Scavenger here. Yeah, let's actually get rid of the Scavenger. And then we play the land, and we Curse of the Werefox. Fight off the Tempest Heart. I should have done this post-combat, because I could have hit them for 5, but now I can't, or I trade in a Scarecrow Guide. I just forgot the Scarecrow Guide has reach. Just completely forgot this thing is up in the clouds. Missed out on 4 points of damage there, because I thought I was going to get 5 points of damage by doing that pre-combat. And then I saw the reach symbol, and I was like, god dang it. Actually hitting for zero instead of four, when I thought I was going to be hitting for five instead of four. Well, that is not... Cannot possibly be good at all. Okay, yeah, it's... What the heck? Witch Stalker Frenzy off the Scarecrow Guide. Yikes. They have the combat trick, too. They do indeed. All right. Well, needed a bit more mana there. I think if they didn't have Vanguard, 
it could have been a much different game because then we would have had the more man and we would have had the iron crag but yeah kept the two lander ended up needing a lot more lands than we found unfortunately archivist was a huge 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 deal here i i do say it whenever it pops out but it is the kind of card you have to have that early removal for and in green blue we just don't the only removal that green blue has available is basically fight spells that you need to wait till you have creatures out for so by the time we could kill an archivist we had to just kill the bigger creature to not immediately die next turn and then we still immediately died next turn anyway so yeah archivist did a lot of the work here too drew them a bunch of extra cards made sure they always had more gas for uh, clearing the path not gonna be a victory there we are four and one heading into game six well, this is a lot of mana and nothing to do with it yet still gonna keep it because but we're just gonna dump like all these cards out very very quickly so we really just want to draw into some high mana value thing but we have a lot of those in the deck so i think the hand is pretty reasonable we've got three hamlet gluttons a storm Keld vanguard a gatekeeper and an agathus champion for big stuff let's get the second blue in case we hit the uh four four flyer Look at all this mana. This is going to be a sad game if I don't like top deck a Hamlet Glutton this turn. Because uh, it's just such an impressive amount of mana that it, it would be sad if we don't get to do anything explosive with it. And currently we don't, but Collector's Vault can find a card for us. Hopefully. I mean, Collector's Vault makes this hand actually just really good, because now we just dig through lands. If they don't blow up this Collector's Vault with something, it's going to be very, very good. Do I poke for one? They have red and black mana. I mean, they could kill this even if it's not attacking, if they have a rat out or flick a coin. I have enough mana to just spend the treasures willy-nilly. Like, just right now. And a counter witch stalker. Do they have a spell stutter in hand? Oh, a spell scorn thing. Put it back to my hand. All right, they are on Grixis. Very hard to tell with the brown lands, the mud lands. They are very pretty. The old borders are very cool, but it is a little more difficult to tell their colors than uh, the newer kind of full arts and all that. Uh, well, there goes a forest. I could probably discard the Witch Stalker, honestly. There's a Glutton. There we go. That's pretty cool. Crack the food for that. Yeah, we do that all day long. Important to remember, if we hit some more lands and... Um, Draw some more gluttons that we can always sack the Utopia Sprawl, but I don't want to do that just yet. But I guess with Collector's Vault down, it's very unlikely that I won't have some treasure token sitting around to sacrifice to bargain cards anyway. Edge wall pack get a decently wide board state. They've got a flyer and a menace card that can get around our board pretty well. Still at 23 here, I guess 21 after we get hit by Coven, so I'm not really worried yet. I do like the vine stock, so we might be discarding Witch Stalker to the vault. Although Witch Stalker is a 3 3 attacker now because we've got the Hamlet Glutton. I don't know, we'll see. What do we have? Collector's Vault? Island? Okay, we're discarding the island. Nice and easy. Then we play the Witch Stalker and the Vine Stalk. Sure.
Our opponent is down to seven. If they have another spell score in Coven, that would actually be kind of gross. Put ourselves down to just bitter chill here by playing our Restless Vine stock. Although, if they did have another spell score in Coven, that'd cost four of their mana. They'd have like two mana maximum untapped against our board state, which feels pretty good for us, even if we lose our better chill. See what they're up to here. Very aggressive attacks at seven life over there. Callus Cell Sword. Oh, they're going to double up burn spells to kill the glutton. That seems pretty favorable to me. If I find a way to get a 4 power creature on board, they're just dead. So if I just cast this, but do I have the mana to use the vine stock too? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5? I do, so we can also just use vine stock, so let's actually, actually uh, activate the vine stock one time. Yay! We used our magic beans at least one time today, and we are now... Five and one. That was a huge game for Collector's Vault. We had tons of early ramps, so much early mana, and just like nothing to do with it. And Collector's Vault really helped with that because it is kind of a mana sink, but mainly it's helping us like dig through the deck and find those big plays. So big shout out to Collector's Vault for that victory. We are five and one heading into round number seven. All right, this is uh, definitely a worse Collector's Vault hand. We got no ramp going on, not doing anything till turn four or five. This is just dirtling around. I'm still keeping it, I think. Both colors, we can dirtle around and a great stabilizer with the Glutton. But uh, yeah, this could, uh, this could be a bit awkward if our opponent is aggressive. It's just more green black, baby. We love to see the hidden deck pairing system of Arena. Mirror matches all day, only green decks, no aggro. I mean, Witchstalker's not blocking that anyway, so I'm actually just going to play the Collector's Vault. Tangle Span Lookout. That is another one of those cards silver similar to that... Uh, Elvish Archivist thing that just needs to be killed very quickly, or it just takes over the game with card advantage, so that is not a good thing for us to see. Let's draw a card, discard a card, and drop a Witch Stalker, probably. Find a Hollow Scavenger, that's a nice one. Um, Thanks to Collector's Vault for treasures later, I don't think I need to keep a natural second blue source. If I play a Witch Stalker here, I can block the Lookout if they don't put a roll on the board, but if they do, they're just going to make the Lookout a 3-4 and then we're not blocking anyway, so I suppose it might actually be solid to just keep the Treasure Token for next turn. That would let me Hamlet Glutton next turn, sacking a food by using Bakery Raid instead this turn. Alright, yeah, so they had the Roll Token, so if we had jammed out a Witch Stalker and blocked Lookout, they would have killed it with a Roll Token and drawn a card. And that would have been horrific. Still pretty bad for us. Still, this is like a big weakness of our deck. It's just like card draw engine sort of creatures. Just creatures with really solid abilities. Because we just don't have early removal. And especially don't have early removal that stops abilities. We've got like the curse roll that we've had pretty often, but doesn't do anything about abilities. But that's just the general weakness of our color pair. Not a lot we can do about that. Green decks can't really kill things until they get a big creature down, then they can start fighting them, and blue decks can't really kill things until they can hold up mana for a counter spell, so. If your opponent's on the play and they go turn three lookout and all you have is a bunch of ice outs in hand in blue, you're not stopping it. So even if we had our triple ice out in here, they still would have had a lookout this game. They still would have had an archivist that other game. Just 
Not great to see that in our color pair. Suppose I can chill the uh, flyer. And just drop down a 2-3, hope that they're out of rolls for now. Not a lot else I can do. Yeah. Try to stop taking damage here, and then start dirtling around with Collector's Vault. They've always got the Stormkeld Vanguard. Gross. What do we got? Collector's Vault? Yeah, it lands pretty fine. Just play a 3-2 to trade another 4-3. Witchstalker goes to Lookout, Scavenger goes to Werefox, we take the flying damage. Okay, Grave Pact makes it so we trade with Werefox and we lose both our creatures, I guess. That is monumentally annoying, I guess. Yeah, our deck is very, very loose to Grave Pact. If we were like Red Black Rat Aggro, that'd be like the dream card to see. Like, that doesn't do anything. Down to eight it is, then. Probably have to curse roll the six, seven. Should not have played that land this quickly with Collector's Vault. But I still have a lot of things to do with my mana, so I got a little excited. Yeah, we're holding this for the Vanguard. Is there a way to get a 5 Toughness creature down? I guess a Scavenger with a uh, Monster Roll on it would work. Play a scavenger, put a monster roll on it, sack a food. I don't have a food to sack, so it won't work. Never mind. Yeah, so I'm just going to have to two for myself to kill a werefox. Luckily, that's the only creature that's going to die for a while, right? Kind of looks like it. Let's greet it out a little bit. Let's get max value and get the monster roll two here. Could have definitely sent in the scavenger. Ooh, vermin with grave pact. All right. That is also pretty filthy. Yeah, now grave pact is really bad. I was say, just losing two creatures to kill this were fox is not great, but that would be like the only grave pact trigger. But now they trigger Grave Pact to buff the Vermin and then have two creatures that are really expendable attackers to uh, work on wiping out our board. I guess we'd rather have a 3-4 blocker than a 4-3 blocker. It actually doesn't even matter because now I'm just dying to the Barrow Naughty and putting a Curse Roll on it does literally nothing. Makes it a 2-2 instead of a 2-4, but it's still... They can just double buff it. Okay. I forgot about Collector's Vault again. But again, Transmuter doesn't do anything, so let's see. Okay. There's Agatha's Champion. Never mind, it matters. I am not doing a good job playing around with my Collector's Vault. I just keep forgetting about it. And keep playing my lands first. I mean, I'm still dead if I do this, though. Yeah, no, we're still dead. Never mind. Grave Pact means we're still dead. 
So I've got one walker here. I go to one. One is not zero. It's very close. As close as you can get. Okay, we're dead. Trigger Grave Path, get two more creatures, get more damage, draw another card off Lookout. Okay, so... Started playing very dumb with my, my lands there. I think two or three turns in a row played my lands before I used the Collector's Vault, potentially. So, we certain, certainly could have played this out a little better. But we were not getting through that Grave Pact. Maybe... I mean, the last turn definitely wouldn't have gone any differently, but the turn where I, I think, tapped out for, like, a Witch Stalker and a Scavenger and, like, a Werefox ability, I didn't use Collector's Vault that turn, so we could have digged one card deeper had I not played my extra land that turn, and then I discarded that to Collector's Vault and chose what to do uh, instead at that point. So we could have seen, like, one or two cards deeper there. And maybe we find a Stormkeld Vanguard or something that's our only hope. But incredibly unlikely to win that one. Five and two, heading into round eight. And this looks great. Do I play a turn two Goose Mother just to put a Royal Roll on it and get going? Doubt it. Just play a three mana two three, play the nice long slow game here. Getting max value off these cards. Well, Genealogist is not going to get max value. Oh, red-white does not necessarily make me want to play a slow game. Apologies for the squeaky chair. But I am not about to sit in a really uncomfortable chair today. Going down to 18. Iron Crag here. Really hoping they don't bargain away the princess takes flight. Make a 4-4 four four with one food. That would let me Hamlet Glut next turn. Wouldn't draw the card if I do that. I guess I can Iron Crag and Hamlet Glut next turn sacking the Iron Crag. That's probably fine. Honestly. So I can play Hamlet Glutton and play an even bigger Goose Mother later. Most importantly, getting multiple food tokens off the Goose Mother and actually potentially being able to sack them. Oh my god. Stockpiling Celebrant Princess Takes Flight is one of the grossest combos in the format. Guaranteeing they have more removal just at the ready. So now no matter what I play, they just exile it. So we have to just like Collector's Vault here and die to these things. Hate to see that. You know? Do I just play a 3-3 Goose Mother because we know they're just going to Princess Takes Flight our next card anyway? I get the food off of it, even as a 3-3. It's big enough to block the Shepherd. If I don't, I take 5 and go to 9 life here. Just waiting. Alright. This Princess Takes Flight is super bad. I think I have enough mana to get the uh, equipment here. Yep, there's the Princess Takes Flight. Which means maybe we can keep a Hamlet Glutton around. So they have another Celebrant, maybe? Ooh, and the Witch is marked to buff Shepard. I'm actually a little surprised they went for Princess Takes Flight there then. If they had the Witch's Mark to just attack with two, three power creatures, I think the trades would be fine. Let's see. I have the mana to Collector's Vault and still play a Glutton. A 9-9 nine, nine Glutton and a 6-6 six, six Glutton are basically the same thing on this board, so I don't think... 
I'm just trying to put an ever flame onto it. So yeah, let's collector's vault. Find up the bean stock, which unfortunately I don't have the mana to do pre glutton. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. I guess I could sack the the Everflame here to keep the food for maybe a little bit more life gain potentially. This may be better. Song of Totentans. And double strike on the flyer. Seems good. Well, five and three it is. Get a taste of our own medicine in that loss for sure. Some really premium stuff going on. The double princess takes flights just really, really gross with the uh, the stockpiling celebrant combo. But Song of Totentans is also just a huge, huge, huge finisher. Well, five and three, still going to be a very positive record. It's still going to be up in gems in the money today. I think this deck was very capable of a seven win run. We just didn't quite get there in the end. Some loose plays for sure in our second loss. I think that's the game that I played the worst. Our first and third loss, I think, ended up just being pretty, pretty rough matchups overall, and there didn't feel like a ton we could do, right? Because the first matchup, they had the Archivist early. Our color pair just as a whole has very little we can do about that thing, just popping off, drawing them a ton of cards like it did. Um, so they ended up quite a bit ahead in cards. I think I still played out the game fine there. Our second loss, we had a similar issue with their 3 mana 2-3 drawing them a bunch of cards throughout the game and we just didn't have removal for it. Um, but in that game, I just completely forgot how to play with Collector's Vault and kept playing lands before I did anything and then had a turn or two there where because I played the land before using the vault, it was like, well, at this point now I'll just jam out all the creatures when it was probably better to be using the vault and trying to dig into stuff. So that game maybe would have went differently playing perfectly because we had three or four turns in a row that were played, you know, a bit loosely for sure. That could have been tightened up to get slight incremental gains slight incremental advantages that maybe stack up over the course of several turns into being able to actually turn that game around. But then, as you saw there, the final loss also kind of feels like just a rough matchup that we're not going to be able to to change the outcome of there. They just had the, the stockpiling Celebrant Princess Takes Flight combo, which is incredible against big creatures, um, big like one-for-one -one trades like that, and that's all we had in hand was our big creatures. So it's like, well... We can jam these out and get them killed or play nothing and just die on board. And those are basically our two options. We did try to Collector's Vault and dig into stuff that game. I think I played that one out fine. Like the Goose Mother just at three mana just to get the Princess Takes Flight out of the way. So maybe the Glutton gets in. Again, some really minor things that we could have changed. But it wouldn't have changed the amount of like cards that we saw in terms of like draw and discard and stuff. It would have just been like, I would have had a food token instead of an iron crag. I think that might have been better to sack the iron crag instead of the food token to the glutton. Little stuff like that, but in the first and third loss, I don't think any of that little stuff would have changed things. Maybe the second loss, and if we had changed the course of the second game, that would be a 6-2 and two run right now, which means we would have had a shot at the full 7 wins, so that's the game I think I'm really disappointed about. I just completely completely punted on uh, Collector's Vault plays multiple turns, which I did in some of our wins as well. I think uh, I was just playing very poorly with the Collector's Vault uh, today as a whole, and it was still being a very impressive card. But yeah, there were multiple games that we won earlier that I was talking about where it's like figuring out how much mana you need to, to use the vault and then hold the treasure up or sometimes use the treasure to the vault, stuff like that. We were definitely finding some really loose lines, incorrect ways to be using our mana with the vault. Sometimes we could have been using the vault and I was just forgetting because it was like I was ending the turn with one mana untapped, which is like, well, technically that means we could have used the vault and then sacked the treasure to do everything we did that turn. So overall, that was the big downside today. One of the biggest user error things was just collector's vault as a whole was... Uh, 
the card that I played the worst that led to the, the most punts, I think. So, uh, kind of, yeah, a decent amount of punts, decent amount of misplays today. Only really led to one of our losses, but had we played perfectly, who knows, this deck might have made it to a 7 when run. So, 5-3 and three in the end, unfortunately, probably definitely at least in part due to user error i think the deck is capable of a seven win run maybe with perfect plays and maybe with some better matchups it would have made it there but today is not going to be that day we just get slightly in the money with 1600 gems and four packs but that is going to end today's video as always i'd like to thank my patrons and youtube members for their support as well as you for watching the videos if you're interested in seeing some more videos like this, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to tell the YouTube algorithm to send you some more on your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below where I am live every Wednesday. And if you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.